In this tutorial, we're going to go through a few of my favorite recipes, which I think will help kickstart your learning by either providing a refresher, or if you've just finished a beginner's course, to help introduce you to some of the aspects that Python has that you might not be aware of. Let's not waste any time and get straight to it. We want to take a look at the collections module at the counter class. So we've taken a paragraph from the documentation of the web browser built-in module and we've pasted it here as a list of strings. Using the len method, we can see that we have 63 words here, or rather words and punctuation. In order to use the counter class, we import it from the collections module and then we pass into the constructor any iterable. We can then use the most common method of the counter class to see the frequency of every item that we had. If we want to see the three most common items, then we just pass in the three into the most common method. Why don't we take this further? We're looking to split this into a list based on a number of delimiters. This is one reason why learning your regular expressions is so useful because it allows you to do so many things and really does increase your capacity and capability as a programmer. You might have initially thought to use the split method of the string class. However, this will lead to several lines of unsightly code when really you could just use one line here with regular expressions and get your result. In one stroke, we've got our words in a list and we've also omitted all of the separators. Now, in our search to find the most common words, we don't have punctuation like the comma interfering. I don't know if you noticed, but in the previous example, we had a shorter paragraph from the documentation than we do here. This illustrates something else about the counter class. We can use simple mathematical operators. Here, we're subtracting the words from earlier from this paragraph. Python dictionaries are enormously helpful, but how do we map multiple items to a single key? Here we have a one and a two, but we can't assign them both to the key a as they are. Taking this further, we have our items here. And to map multiple items to a single key, we might use this for loop. For each key and value in items, if the key isn't already in the dictionary, then we create a set, assign it to the key, and then we add the value to the keys set. So we're holding the items that we want in a set assigned to the key. We can do this another way with the default dict. All we need to do at first is tell Python which data structure we'd like it to contain our items in. Note that we've written set, but we haven't called it. If we wanted to create a set, we would call it. But Python does that for us with the default dict. So no brackets after the set. The for loop that we write this time is much reduced. All we need to say is for each key and value in items, add the value to the keys set. If we had decided to use a list here and written default dict list, then in our for loop, instead of adding the add method that sets have, we would use the append method that lists have. You'll see asterisk args and double asterisk quags written a lot, but what do they mean? When we write asterisk args, in its place, we can write any number of positional arguments. So any arguments that don't have a keyword, we can use. When we write quags, we can only use keyword arguments, like so. The quags has to follow the args. So if we write this, we have to pass our positional arguments first, and then we can put our keyword only arguments. You'll see this used in decorators, as it means that the decorator can accept any function call, so any arguments that the function's called with, and it can do this with no knowledge of what function is decorated with it. Sometimes you'll have iterables of arbitrary length, 
So for instance, we have a tuple here which contains the string localhost and the port number 5000. If we're expecting something like this and we want to unpack it into separate variables, that is to say we want a variable which has localhost assigned to it and another which has the port number, we do it like this. You just have to make sure that you have as many variable names as you do items which will be unpacked from the right hand side. And bear in mind that this works for any iterable. Strings are iterables, so here we have string, and obviously it has six letters, so we assign A to F, and now we have each variable assigned to each individual letter. For our next example, let's jump into the REPL. The OS built-in module is fantastic. Let's demonstrate a couple of methods that can come in handy. File1 and Path1 are a file and a directory which exist on my file system respectively. There are methods like exists, which will give us true or false depending on whether the path that we've passed in exists. When we pass in something that doesn't exist, it returns false. Furthermore, there are methods to tell us whether what we've passed in is a file, whether it's a directory, or whether it's a symbolic link. We have full access to the metadata, we can get the size in bytes, we can get the modified time, along with much else. Here the modified time returned to us is in seconds past the Unix epoch. Make sure you have in your back pocket a way of converting that to date time. Here we use the from timestamp method in the datetime module to do just that. And then to convert the object returned to a string, we use the string format time method. It's definitely worth knowing about which functions return bytes, which functions don't, especially if you're doing any network programming. It can also help you get unstuck in situations that you otherwise would have. Binary data can be read from a text file by reading from its buffer attribute instead, and the same goes for writing. The three I.O. standard streams, input-output standard streams, are standard in, standard out, and standard error. Standard out is where your program will output to unless you've redirected it. The I.O. system is built from layers. Standard out is always open in text mode. Sometimes you need to write binary data to it. As you can see, when we import the sys built-in module, we have access to the standard streams. Each of these has a buffer. If we want to write bytes, what happens is we get an error. But as I said before, it's layered, and the buffer can be written to with bytes. And that's what we do here, and we're able to write bytes to standard out. The number after the text there is the number of bytes which have been written. We can do other pretty interesting things with standard out. Here, using a context manager, we've opened the sys help file. In write mode, the lack of a B after the W means that it's in text mode and not in binary mode. What we're going to do is we're going to print the output of help sys to our file syshelp.txt. Normally, if you were to type help sys in the interpreter, the output would be printed to screen. But we'll subvert this. First, we'll create our own previous standard out, and we'll assign to it the current standard out, and then we'll point the standard out to our file. So now, the standard out is actually our file. So when we type help sys, the output will be directed to our file as opposed to the terminal. After we're done, we'll make the sys.standard out the same as it previously was, and that's why we have the previous standard out there. To prove this is working, in the terminal, we'll have a look at what's been put in the file. As you can see, the help docs of the sys module are now safely written in our file. There's a decorator that does just this in the context lib built in module called redirect standard out. The underlying mechanics are just as I'm showing you here. I hope you've enjoyed this short recipe list. To show your support for the channel, please subscribe and like, and let anyone know who might be interested.